Big thanks to Anchor for sponsoring this video. If you're looking to buy one of the new M1 Pro MacBooks, you would have noticed there's quite a few configuration options. And the cheapest upgrade option is upgrading from an eight core CPU to the 10 core CPU version. And in this video, we're going to be seeing if those extra CPU cores make a difference, how hot they make the M1 Pro compared to the base model M1 Pro, what effect they have on battery life, and finally, if the extra 200 US dollar price tag is worth it. Now, I will make sure to put timestamps down below if you want to skip to a section that you're particularly interested in. Apart from that, let me unplug both of these machines from battery. As you can see, they're both at 100% charge, and we're gonna see at the end of all of this testing, which one has more charge left. So first of all, let's start with some standard benchmarks, and the first one's going to be Geekbench 5. So let me just start this CPU benchmark, and while it runs, let's just quickly talk about some of the pricing options. So like I said previously, this is an extra 200 US dollars more expensive. So on the base model M1 Pro, you get six high performance cores and two high efficiency cores. And on the upgraded or the less binned M1 Pro chip with 10 CPU cores, you get eight high performance cores and the same two high efficiency cores. Apart from that, everything on these machines are exactly the same, down to physical dimensions, weight, cooling, everything else exactly the same. So the results are in, as you can see, we got 9,933 for the base model M1 Pro, and then 12,386 on the upgraded CPU version. And in terms of single core scores, it's exactly the same, which makes sense because it is the exact same type of CPU cores on either machine. Obviously this one just has two additional ones. So if we now move on to a metal compute between the two machines, you'll see that when this finishes running in a second, they're gonna be almost exactly the same. And that's because the GPUs on these machines are identical. And as expected, as you can see, they're both almost identical. So let's move on to something a little bit more demanding, and that is a Cinebench R23 benchmark. So I'm gonna run this test, and after about eight minutes, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna see what the internal temperature is like on each of the CPUs, and I'm also gonna see what the external temperature is like with the FLIR thermal camera. So let's start the benchmark on both devices. So we're about three minutes into this benchmark, and there's something I wanna show you real quick. So you might be able to see there that the fans on the 10 core M1 Pro have kicked on and they're sitting at about 4,400 RPM versus the fans on just the base model only at about 2,700 RPM. Now in terms of actual fan noise, these definitely are more audible than the fans on the left. So that's interesting to see such a difference only three minutes into this benchmark. All right, so it's been about eight minutes at this point. So let's check out what the internal temperature of the CPU is like. So as you can see on the base model, eight core CPU version, uh, we're sitting at about a 92 degrees average temperature. If we look at the performance cores here, we're sitting at about low 90s in terms of temperatures. And then moving over to the 10 core CPU, uh, we're a little bit hotter by about three or four degrees uh, for the average CPU temperature. Uh, we can see all the performance cores here are actually getting into the mid 90s. So definitely is running hotter. You can see again, it's still the fans are uh, a little bit higher as well. So we're sitting at about 4,500 RPMs versus 3,200. And if we now take a look at the exterior thermal profile, it looks like they're about the same. So if we look right in the middle of the base model eight core CPU, we're getting around 45 degrees, 47 degrees, absolute max. Uh, in terms of the rest of the chassis, about 34, 33. Moving over to the eight core CPU, we're gonna see if this is hotter at all. And it's almost exactly the same. So maybe half a degree difference. And obviously it seems like the higher RPM speed of the fans is keeping this chip relatively cool, even though it is running hotter than the eight core CPU version. So the Cinebench benchmark has completed. And once again, the single core score was exactly the same, but for the multi-core score on the eight core CPU version, we got 9,541. And then on the 10 core CPU version, 
we got 12,335. And that is a relatively significant difference. It's about 20% in favor of the 10 core CPU M1 Pro. Now moving into some more real life benchmarks, as you can see, I have compressor opened up on both machines. I've loaded a compressed H.264 file onto here that we're actually going to convert. So this is a Sony A7S Mark III clip. It's in 4K, really high quality, but very, very compressed. And I'm going to transcode this from H.264 into ProRes 422. So if we come over here and we add a translation. So it's finished and we got exactly the same score, just 17 seconds to transcode that clip on both devices. And this is probably more so relying on the hardware and video encoder and decoders built into the M1 Pro, less so on the CPU. So let's try out some Lightroom and see if we can find any differences between the two. But first, a quick word from this video's sponsor, Anchor. Enjoy amazingly clear video calls thanks to this HDR webcam from Anchor. This PowerConf C300 webcam is a great addition to any office, home office, or a student setup. Say goodbye to the grainy laptop camera and hello to the bright, clear, and professional looking image in any environment. It incorporates AI technology, which assists with face tracking to always keep you in the frame, instant autofocus, smart auto framing, and multiple meeting modes, such as streaming, meeting, and personal. Protect your privacy with the included privacy cover, which you can snap into place and slide over the lens. Click the link in the description below to check out the Anchor webcam PowerConf C300. So as you can see here, I have 50 raw 24 megapixel photos. And if we flick through these photos of the created cat, uh, I can't tell any difference. They're both pretty much exactly the same. So moving on to exporting these images, I've done some minor color correction. So let's export and we'll hit the start button. Okay, so the 10 core CPU has just finished, followed by the eight core CPU and that has just finished as well. So a difference of only eight seconds between the two, but again, guys, like I've said in previous benchmarks, if this was maybe 50 megapixel photos instead of 24 megapixel photos, or it was 500 instead of 50, that particular gap can really start to add up over time. So moving on to some 3D applications, let's start with Blender. So I have the Mr. Elephant demo file up here. I'm in the wireframe view at the moment. If I switch between views, you probably won't notice a massive difference between the two. And you can see that I am using the EV render engine for this one. We will check out a cycles one in a second, guys. Let's come up here to render and let's render out a single frame and they've both finished and exactly the same time here. So 35 seconds, which makes sense. Uh, EV isn't really CPU heavy, it's more so on the GPU. So let's move on to a more cycles heavy render. Here we have the barbershop demo file off the Blender website. Now this is obviously cycles heavy. Um, so if we come in here, we just check, yep, that's cycles, yep, uh, device using CPU, cool. So let's come up here to the render tab and let's just render out a single image. Now that the render has completed, we can see a pretty big difference between the two. So on the base model M1 Pro with the eight core CPU, we have 16 minutes and 35 seconds versus the upgraded less binned 10 core CPU with 12 minutes and 47 seconds. So moving on to some editing, testing and benchmarking. As you can see on the screen, I have Resolve. It is the most up to date Apple Silicon native version of Resolve. I have some Sony A7S Mark III footage. So 4K, uh, 422, 10 bit, basically some of the highest quality 4K footage you can get. Uh, that is on the timeline right now. It's H.264 and the actual codec is really compressed. Um, so it's typically very difficult to play back. Uh, if we play back both of these scenes and timelines, you can see that's playing back perfectly fine, there's no issues there. The FPS counter is green, which means there's no dropped frames or anything like that. Uh, in terms of actual scrubbing, not gonna notice a difference. And guys, I did some testing on this earlier before this video. In the actual editing process, so when you're color coding, uh, adding effects and things like that, 
you're really not going to see any kind of difference. Uh, if there is any kind of difference with editing, it doesn't matter what program you use, whether it's Premiere, Resolve, or Final Cut, it's going to be at the render stage. Just to test something out real quick, you can see this first clip here is two minutes long. So let's actually add a stabilization effect to this and see if there's any difference between the two. Okay, so I'm just using the default stabilize settings. So I'm gonna click stabilize. I'm also going to start the timer. So the stabilization effect has been applied. There was a one second difference between the two, which is essentially margin of error. I probably just clicked one button a little bit quicker than the other. But apart from that, almost no differences at all. So let's render out this particular timeline. Now this is a six minute 4K timeline. So I'm just going to select the default YouTube 4K settings and we're going to add to render queue and we're going to render both of those projects. And the render has finished. And once again, guys, absolutely zero difference between the two. They both finished the render in three minutes and 11 seconds. And that kind of makes sense because these days editing programs like Resolve don't really rely on the CPU any longer. It's mainly the RAM and more specifically the GPU. And obviously now on these M1 Pro Max, you're gonna also see a big increase with the inbuilt hardware encode and decode engines specifically for editing and for footage. Moving on to gaming, we have some GFX metal benchmarks that we're going to run. So we're going to click start and the benchmark has completed and turns out again, no difference at all. So we got 93.4 FPS on the base model M1 Pro with eight core CPU and then 93.47 FPS on the less binned 10 core CPU. Moving on to a Tomb Raider benchmark. As you can see, we've got the display settings all exactly the same, resolution 1920 by 1200, and the refresh rate at 120 Hertz to take advantage of that really nice ProMotion technology. Our graphics settings exactly the same as well. So let's run this benchmark, and see what kind of scores we can achieve. And once again, guys, absolutely no difference between the two. 43 FPS on the eight core CPU versus 43 FPS on the 10 core CPU. So at this point, it's been about an hour and a half of continuous testing, benchmarking, rendering, etc. So let's have a look at the battery life and how they differ between the two. So on the 10 core CPU M1 Pro, you can see we have 59% battery remaining versus the eight core M1 Pro, we have 61% remaining. So that's just a 2% difference between the two. And if we were to continue for another one or two hours and completely drain these batteries to zero, that's about a 4% difference in battery life in favor of the M1 Pro. It's gonna last about 4% longer than the M1 Pro with the additional two CPU cores. Okay, so let's talk about what this means for you and your purchase decision. So is it worth the extra 200 US dollars? Well, I'm actually gonna go against the grain and say that yes, it is only for certain people. So if you're doing a lot of really CPU intensive stuff, so a lot of Lightroom, uh, a lot of cycle renders on Blender, for example, those programs and apps and processes where you're really gonna be stressing that CPU, yes, you will see a difference of about 15 to 20%, which isn't massive, but again, guys, over the long run, that can really start to add up. Now, some of the drawbacks of that, obviously, it's an extra 200 US dollars. For an extra 200 US dollars, you can double the storage from 512 gigabytes to one terabyte, or you can put that towards possibly upgrading to the M1 Max or the 16 inch version, or possibly even spend another hundred dollars and spend 300 US dollars in total, get the extra two GPU cores on top of the extra two CPU cores. Uh, so it's really up to you. And another drawback of course is slightly less battery and slightly increased fan noise. So if you're one of those people that does a lot of cycles render, or perhaps you use a lot of Photoshop and Lightroom where you're exporting photos constantly, I think possibly it would be worth 200 US dollars, but for everyone else, I definitely do not think that you need it. 
Uh, you know, you're not going to be using it in editing, uh, in other things like gaming. It's not going to make any kind of difference. It's just an extra 200 US dollars that you could just spend elsewhere. But yeah, guys, pretty interesting results. I was pretty excited myself to test this out and benchmark it to see if the discrepancy was large or small. Hopefully you guys found this interesting as well and hopefully it helped you make a more informed purchase decision. But apart from that guys, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.